Uh, I came to Warsaw as a Fulbright scholar in September of, 19, uh, of 2002, and I'll be here until uh, June of this year. Uh, I came here to lecture, and the course that I lectured on in the fall semester was The Neural Control of Sleep and Waking, which is based on this book that I had just completed. The book was published in October of last year, and I came in September, and when the book was printed, uh, the publisher sent me the, the first copy so that I could use it and have my students get it as the textbook. And what I'd like to do now is, in the short time I have, to talk about the major points in the uh, story about sleep and waking, the neural control of sleep and waking. I begin my book with a quotation from William Shakespeare. And the quotation is, the best of rest is sleep. Shakespeare tells us an important truth. After a full day of being awake and being active, um, by 10 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock at night, 2200, 2300 at night, uh, you're very tired and ready for sleep and you really cannot function too well. If you uh, lay in bed and do not sleep, during this period of time, as some people have trouble sleeping. Uh, the next day, they are extremely tired and cannot function. So it's clear that if you're laying in bed quietly, resting, but not sleeping, it does not do it. Something has to happen, namely sleep. And when you do sleep, the next day you're ready for your day's activity again. So something during those uh, eight or so hours spent sleeping uh, rejuvenates you and you're ready to do another day. Uh, but what it is about sleep that does that is really not known. That's still a mystery. I mean, people have known from the very beginning that sleep was important and if you did not sleep, the next day you could not function. Uh, and so it's been a question that people have asked for a long time. What is it about sleep that is important? And I hate to say it, but at the very beginning, we have to admit that we do not know what it is that sleep does. However, in uh, the last 50 years or so, we have discovered uh, how we sleep, what happens in the brain to produce sleep and to produce waking. The modern era of biological research on sleep and waking began at the turn of the 20th century, at the beginning of the 1900s. During the first half of the 20th century, uh, there were developments in technology in brain research, most of this occurred in Europe, that laid the basis for the science that developed in the second half of the 20th century. And uh, World, World War II was the division between the first half of the century, happened in uh, mid-century, uh, before World War II, there was the basic um, technology that was needed for the sleep research that occurred during the second half of the century. And a lot of the, um, the groundwork was laid at the beginning of the century. I'll start with describing the early developments that laid the groundwork for the advances in research that occurred after World War II. The first major advance in the area of sleep and waking in the 20th century was the development of the technology that permitted us to record the electrical activity from the brain. Uh, the instrument that was necessary to do that is called the electroencephalograph, or shortly the EEG machine. Uh, the technology for the electroencephalography is attributable to, attributed to Hans Berger, who was a professor of neurology and psychiatry at the University in Jena, Germany. It used to be East Germany, now it's part of Germany altogether. Uh, Berger worked for years prior to World War I to develop the technique to record the electrical activity from the brains of animals. The work was frustrating, he had very little success, and the basic reason for his lack of success in his early work was the fact that the brain waves are in the order of microvolts, millionths of a volt, very, 
very minuscule electrical voltages. And the state of the art in recording electrical activity did not exist. His daughter married a, an engineer from the Siemens company in Germany. And the engineer was working on a project which developed one of the earliest amplifiers, a vacuum tube amplifier. And uh, the son-in-law uh, gave to Berger one of these very, very early amplifiers. And this permitted him to be successful to measure EEG waves. And his first recording was in 1918, I believe it was, where he recorded the brain waves from his young son. Uh, by putting scalp electrodes on and recording and feeding them through the amplifier and recording them on the EEG machine. Uh, Berger, based on this work, uh, became very famous and he uh, rose to the position of rector of his university, University of Jena, the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena. Became the rector of the university and uh, However, in, 19 in the 1930s, when National Socialism uh, began arising in Germany, um, Berger, who had opposed this development, he was very anti-Hitler, uh, he was forced to leave his university before he was ready to retire. He became very depressed, and this is an interesting story, I think, about Berger, became very depressed. and. Uh, entered his university hospital as a patient and then hung himself. So this was a tragic end to a, a brilliant person. Parallel story, a tragically parallel story, occurred to a scientist who preceded Berger. This was a man by the name of Adolf Beck who received his PhD at the University of Krakow in Poland. Uh, Beck, uh, prior to Berger's work, had succeeded in recording brain waves from animals. And he saw the brain waves uh, when the animal was asleep, was asleep and in waking. So uh, Beck was the first to record brain, one of the first to record brain waves during sleep and waking. And Berger was the first to do this in the human. Uh, in 1895, uh, uh, Beck moved to the University of Lvov, which was at that time still in Poland. It's now a part of Ukraine. And like Berger, he had an illustrious career, and he rose to the position of dean and rector at his university. However, again tragically, uh, due to the Nazis, uh, they came into Poland in September of 1939, as we all know, and, uh, and Beck, who was Jewish, was a target for the final solution. And in 1942, he had gotten sick went into his university hospital to recover from his sickness and the Germans came to take him away to the concentration camps and his son who was a physician gave the whole family cyanide pills and uh, Beck committed suicides as well as the rest of the family and as it has sometimes been put they cheated the gas chamber. So these are I think two uh, somewhat interesting stories to the development of the technology for uh, the field of sleep and waking. The first substantial information that we have about which parts of the brain control the functions of sleep and waking came from observations during the great influenza epidemic in 1917 to 1919. In Vienna there was a psychiatrist, a neurologist, and a neurohistologist. This is one person who had skills in different fields. His name was Konstantin von Economo. Uh, he was from Greek descent, but he was, he was an Austrian. Uh, he saw patients with the disease during the height of the ap epidemic, and he wanted to see which parts of the brain were affected to produce the sleep. And he had learned a recently developed stain for the, for the animal and human brain. Uh, after his patients died from this epidemic, and they, after they uh, had the coma, the sleep coma, and they eventually died, he removed the brains of some of these people, uh, did the histology on it, that is, cut the brains into very thin sections, mounted them on microscope slides, and then stained them with a newly developed stain, 
which showed the brain cells. And what he discovered was that the people who died from this sleeping disorder, excessive sleep, uh, had lost nerve cells in a part of the brain called the reticular formation and the posterior hypothalamus. What Moruzzi and Magoon did was to use cats as their experimental subjects. They put electrodes into the region of the brain that uh, Von Economo had discovered was necessary for waking, because when the cells are gone, the person sleeps. Uh, they put electrodes into that region of the cat's brain, and when they stimulated that area of the cat's brain, when the animal was asleep, when the cat was showing sleep, they immediately awakened the cat. So what Von Economo had shown was, uh, was an area necessary to produce arousal. What Moruzzi and Magoon showed was that when you stimulate electrically that region in a brain, the animal will awaken. So that proved, with two good pieces of evidence, that this, in fact, was what some people call the awake center or the arousal center of the brain. This has been confirmed many times over in other animals and in humans, in fact. We know clearly what causes arousal. Now the question is, what causes sleep? And instead of going into all of the details of much research, I'll uh, try to describe what we now, most of us, agree on. Uh, that there are, in contrast to waking, which is centrally located in the middle of the brain. It turns out that there are regions way in the back of the brain and way in the front of the brain, very far apart, that when activated will produce, uh, will produce sleep. Uh, I, and as well as many others, have done these types of experiments where we uh, stimulate regions of the brain. Mostly this has been done in the cat. And uh, after uh, half a minute, half a minute, 30, 40 seconds of stimulation, the cat will uh, turn around as though it's getting ready to rest, as cats do. Before they go to sleep, they, they walk around in a circle, and then they lay down, put the head down, and they're asleep. And here you have a cat that's interacting with you. Uh, he's awake, feeding perhaps. And if we stimulate this region of the brain, the cat will stop what it's doing, do this, this little routine of turning around, lay its head down, and the EEG clearly shows, as well as the behavior, that the cat is asleep. So we know that there are regions which will produce sleep, and they're in different, re different parts of the brain. Now the question is, when you stimulate that area, what is it that you're doing that produces the sleep? And one of the experiments that I and my students did, oh, this was a long, one of my first experiments, was in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, if I remember. Uh, we uh, stimulated this region, these regions of the brain, two or three of them in a cat, and we put recording electrodes into the reticular formation, the center of the arousal system. It's a, we had a very simple hypothesis, but no one had done it before that when you stimulate these sleep areas, what you may be doing is inhibiting the neurons of the area that produces arousal, right? You shut it down. And uh, we, in fact, showed that. So this was the, uh, really the first good evidence that sleep is produced by an inhibition of the arousal area. Uh, the whole area of dream sleep was uh, studied scientific, the beginning of that area, area was studied scientifically uh, at the University of Chicago. Nathaniel Kleitman, uh, a professor at, in the physiology department at Chicago, had come from Ukraine. He started out uh, in Europe, came, came to the United States as a young man, got his PhD in physiology, and took a professorship at University of Chicago and started a sleep lab. Then in the early 50s, he had a few students uh, who worked with him. One of them, Eugene Nazarinsky, was put onto a project where he was uh, told that he should watch infants while they were asleep to watch their eye movements. And he observed that when the infants were asleep, they had 
rapid eye movements. He later confirmed this with adults as well. And at the same time, the EEG looked like an arousal state. So if you record the EEG from a sleeping person, they show a typical wave pattern when they're in non-dream sleep. As soon as they go into a dream state, they show an EEG that looks like they're awake and uh, their eye movements are become very rapid. This is, it has since been called rapid eye movement sleep. And when a person is awakened, as Azarinsky did for the first time, when he awakened people that were showing the flat EEG during sleep and the rapid eye movements, they said they were awakened from a sleep state. And this was the first observation, or the first finding, that sleep can objectively be, or dreams, can objectively be recorded. Um, one of the recent areas of interest in dream research is to see what the relationship may be between dream sleep and memory and learning. Uh, it has been hypothesized by a number of people that uh, dream sleep permits you to consolidate the memories that you uh, have produced during the day. So you learn material during the day, and, uh, and it may well be that during sleep you rehearse it, or something happens during sleep. We don't know exactly what, we still don't know what, but uh, something may happen, and there is very good evidence now from a number of different labs throughout the world that, uh, that material that's learned during the day is effectively consolidated. It's, it's stored in a form that you can recall it later. And if people are uh, presented material to learn and then prevented from sleeping, they do not recall the material as well as if they were permitted to sleep. So something is happening in the brain and there is a great deal of controversy as to whether it's happening during dream sleep or non-dream sleep. And there's evidence that different types of learning, motor learning, for example, versus uh, cognitive type learning, you know, learning a motor skill, like riding a bicycle. That's a, it's a form of learning, obviously. But it's very different than learning uh, how to solve problems. And that different types of learning may be consolidated into memory stored effectively into memory during different stages of sleep. And um, that's probably one of the hottest areas now of sleep research. Uh, there's a whole field of uh, sleep medicine that developed in the last, say, 10, 20 years. And a lot of research, a lot of the basic sleep scientists, scientists interested in basic phenomena of sleep, are turning to applied areas applied meaning to solve some of the medical problems. One of the huge problems, practical problems, is excessive daytime sleepiness, where people are asleep, uh, during, they become very tired during the day, and if they're working in a sensitive type job, they can produce huge accidents. Chernobyl is attributable to uh, workers who were sleep deprived and were sleepy and uh, they failed to observe what the signs were for the blow up of the, ex of the uh, nuclear plant. Uh, truck drivers, or any type of driver, uh, very often, most of the accidents that happen on the highway are due to the fact that people are sleepy. And uh, one of the areas of sleep research is to uh, find out what causes that, and uh, there are a number of causes that we now know uh, one of them is sleep apnea, uh, where people are, um, when they sleep, they stop breathing. And when they stop breathing, they only start again. They stop breathing for 20, 30 seconds. And when they, uh, and when they, the only way they can start breathing again is to awaken. And people like this will awaken two, three hundred times a night and not even be aware of the fact that they've been awakened in order to breathe again. Uh, and the next day, they're wiped out, uh, an Americanism. They're, they're, they're incapable of performing. They're extremely tired. They don't know why. Now we know that uh, things like sleep apnea are the cause of this. 
So but the, the bottom line is that uh, these days, many, er, many workers in the areas of sleep are uh, turning to practical problems related to sleep medicine. The problems that uh, sleep workers are working on now are things like insomnia, the inability to sleep, which some people have, uh, sleep apnea, um, narcolepsy, where people will suddenly fall asleep for no good, for no obvious reason, where during the day they're awake and they'll have a narcoleptic attack, attack where they will suddenly drop the head and go to sleep. Uh, another, another of the disorders is sudden infant death syndrome, where the infant uh, between the ages of two or three months and about six months, that, that's the window of time during which this happens. Perfectly healthy infants will die during their sleep, and it's called sudden infant death syndrome, or crib death or cob, cot death. In England, it's called cot death. Uh, and it's still not clearly known why this occurs. Uh, but that's an area that scientists are working on in order to uh, deal with some of these clinical, uh, clinical disorders.